SJC 13394, Commonwealth v. William McDermott. All righty. Attorney Barnwell. <coughs> Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court, Hayne Barnwell on behalf of William McDermott. In Watkins, this court held that even when a defendant has received prior plenary review, the court doors remain open to remedy a grave lingering injustice. Here, the grave lingering injustice is of a piece with the widespread fear and disgust of gay men that prevailed in the 1980s. As the appeals court emphasized in Barron, homophobia prevailed not only in communal beliefs and ignorance, but also within the legal system itself. Here, the prosecutor wielded those prejudices against Mr. McDermott and a corroborative defense witness to discredit them and thereby achieve a guilty verdict. The egregious prosecutorial misconduct should have been remedied long ago. This court can now remedy it, and with that remedy, show the public and gay people whether they appear in court as victims, defendants, witnesses, or advocates that bigotry will, not, will be condemned no matter when or how it expresses itself. What about the, um, the parole hearing? Because mm. everything, everything you say is, is, is obviously true. It echoes off the wall, disgusting. Um, uh, but what about the parole hearing? Because one might say the same thing about the defense if it's not true. The parole board statements are not relevant to whether he had a fair trial in 1982. Obviously, the jury um, would not have been aware of those statements. Those statements came decades later. What is um, the standard under Rule 30, though? Under Rule 30, it's broadly whether justice um, was done. And, and so isn't the question of whether justice was done impacted by what um, your client said at the parole hearing in 2012? Or in, in fact, just six days before he filed the motion for a new trial? No, because under uh, Commonwealth versus Azar, um, the substantial risk standard, and I can see that we are now under a substantial risk standard. We're, not, we're no longer under the broad sort of just whether justice was done. But Azar says that we look at the errors in the context of the trial. And the context of the trial, of course, would not have the parole board statements. The other issue is that that Azar well, is about really parole board statements. I'm, I'm sorry. But did Azars involve parole board statements? Um, they they did not, but it's it's it's. So this been, is a new issue that we need to address. Yeah, and Th we, that is true. And we we also alluded to this in Pfeiffer, that that you know this does relate to the trial because you still if you have to zoom out a little bit and and th this this is important because it's part of the credibility of your of your position. If we were to do this, understanding what what. Uh, the defendant has said at the parole board hearing. Isn't there a chance that we make a mockery of our system that, that we know that there's this, and I understand that you discredit what he says at the parole board hearing and all of the impetus and, and, and uh, the pressure to uh, uh, allocute. Assume for the sake of argument that he lied about what he said. And so now just think about what this looks like. He gets a new trial based on a lie uh, because of a concern that he was exploiting the, the same prejudices that you're telling us, that you're talking about. It works both ways. That he utilized. That's the right. problem, that he utilized. Well, certainly I am not the final arbiter of the truth of these statements, and more importantly, the Commonwealth is not the final arbiter of truth with regard to these statements. The way the, way the court could write the opinion is to say the, the integrity of the system is undermined by the bigotry at this trial. As far as the parole board statements, those have not been vetted through. There are actually many ways these things have to be vetted. One, through a pretrial investigation by the defense. Um, the defense attorney will certainly zealously investigate this. Is there any substantiation for it, yes or no? Uh, there's still um, trial counsel. Um, does trial counsel say this happened? I have, I have a feeling he'll say no. Um, and so then we, he would be put on the witness list. You, then you, want, have to, you want us yeah. to be duped, right? I'm sorry? It's okay if we're duped. If, well, if that, that assumes these are reliable. That assumes these are voluntary. Well, in categorically, you say that any facts that weren't added uh, were not submitted to the jury shouldn't be considered, correct? Should not be considered, All correct. Right. There's a kind of a heads I win, tails I lose argument that defense is making in that 
Did you consider the case of Commonwealth versus Dowds? Commonwealth versus Dowds were brain injury evidence mm -hmm. that were not admitted in front of the jury, and we allowed relief to the defendant, saying it was unfair. He gets a new trial, or gets a, got a reduction, I think, to a second degree because of these facts on, mm -hmm. on, under, on the interests of justice. But those were facts that were outside the trial record, not presented to the jury. So why is it okay to use the evidence in Dowds but not use the parole board hearing? I am lucky that I worked on Dowds a long time ago, so I am familiar with that case. Um, so the, the, I think appropriate- I, I wrote it, that's why I'm asking. Oh no, I, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I think otherwise I wouldn't have uh, known about Dowds, that's why I'm saying that. Um, so with Dowds, I'm, my recollection is, so the defense brought that up. The defense brings that up through, I believe that was 33E. Post-trial. Post-trial, 33E. So I think a good analogy there would be if, he, if the defense submits medical records and they are just, they're false, they're fabricated. Obviously, the Commonwealth can come back and say, you can't consider no, that, I, I, I get what you're saying about the, about the uh, I think it's a Kentucky case, mm -hmm. and, and I read Bedwood's um, Law Review article as mm -hmm. well um, for that point, and, and, and I think that you provide some supplemental authority recently that says just categorically take out the parole. So if we categorically take it out, that's not an issue. But we're, if we don't take it out, I'm wondering where we are with respect to facts not adduced to the jury when it's good for you, 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 you know, it's, it's in the interest of justice. When it's not good for you, it's not in the interest of justice. So we don't consider them. Well, you don't consider them for purposes of post-conviction motion, especially where the motion is in this case. I have, you know, Mr. McDermott never raised newly discovered evidence limited it limited only um, to the record and so there's a fundamental fairness problem with that but also what the court could say is it's just not for us to decide it's for pre uh, judge during pretrial to determine are these statements reliable in the first instance and any other arguments I can think of many by the way um, that defense attorney could make to at least try to get out most if not all of these statements and then it's for the jury to decide he wasn't un only under oath that one time he was under oath <coughs> four times so, does the jury believe that he told the truth the first three times? Does the jury believe he told the truth? No, you know what? I don't, I don't believe those past uh, uh, consistent uh, with the defense um, statements. I now believe what the Commonwealth urges me to believe, which is that fourth one under oath. The fourth one where he says, okay, I did it, you're right. Um, you know, and, and the first three denials, if you look carefully at the first three, when he's, when he's consistent with his defense, what do they tell him? We don't believe you. If, we don't believe you. If we agree with you as far as the parole board yes. goes, um, we follow what Bedwood says in K Kentucky. Well, although the Kentucky court doesn't reach it. They, I, I'm sorry. I the just I'm sorry. I'm, okay, probably because I'm mumbling. <laughs> yeah. the, the Kentucky court doesn't reach the issue ultimately. And, and that's exactly right. And right. that's exactly what so, this court could say. Right. We're not going to reach it. That's well, for the well, jury. Let me ask you so, yep. the next question is, suppose we agree with you. All right, okay. and we say categorically because the motive is to mollify the parole board and, and um, we, we exclude them. Isn't the remedy to remand it to the trial, to the motion judge to exclude the parole board issue and then decide the case anew? Um, the, the, the motion judge is that, um, that, that is, I am asking for that for alternative relief. Um, however, this court could also um, decide it on the record. Um, this court has all of the materials it needs um, to decide the issue, so there's no special, you know, deference to the motion judge. This is limited to the record. This isn't about, um, you know, credibility of, of uh, witnesses, for example, at the evidentiary hearing. But the motion judge, so, did, motion judge did a weigh in, and he that's true, right? And, and that's why I ask it for an alternative that at okay. least, you know, um, to, to to give us a second chance at that. Um, the other um, issue in this case, of course, is that is that this this homophobia that began with this question about skippers. You know, have you visited the skippers bar? Um, and then, of course, the closing argument where he calls, he derides the um, corroborative defense witness as a male prostitute. He's proud that he's gay. I mean, you can just, you know, sometimes, sometimes I know the court says when you read a transcript, it's cold. You know, it's cold. We're just reading a cold transcript. Well, did, didn't didn't um, those comments particularly draw the ire of Justice Liakos, Chief Justice Liakos? when he reduced the um, the verdict to a second degree? 
No, no. The, the verdict, uh, are we discussing the SJC, the, the 1984 opinion? Right. The 1984 opinion centered on the extreme atrocity or cruelty instruction. Um, and that, that had to do with, he, he did not instruct, over defense objection, he did not um, instruct that intoxication could be dis considered. My, my memory is the same uh, as Justice Garciano, right. so that, that the 33E mm -hmm. reduction did consider the nature of the defense. That's my memory. Oh, that, that, that in, that's true. So it said the, the entire posture, you know, we'll consider the, um, the defendant's testimony. We'll take that under consideration. That, that's right. That, that there was the error, but then there was the what now what do we do? Um, with the error, and so we'll consider the defendant's testimony as well as Peter Werner's well, the, the testimony. The homophobia was one factor why they reduced it to second degree, correct? No, he doesn't. He doesn't say that there was any problem with what the prosecutor did. No, there, there's no discussion of that. It's more about this was the defense. We'll sort of take consideration of the defense that this was self-defense against another attempted rape. That's that's what that was about. When when there's mention of homosexuality at all, that's what that's about. Um, you know, we're going to consider your defense, basically, not not that there was any error by the prosecutor in this so, case. So, assuming we agree with you that the comments were um, unacceptable, um, articulate for me your best case for a substantial um, risk of a miscarriage of justice. So, I think um, there are two cases, Mahdi and, Dis uh, uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced this case, D Desiderio. Um, so Mahdi um, talks about how this is essentially this is the whole, when there's when there's prejudice infected in a trial, and that was particularly talking about racial and religious prejudice, but it certainly applies here um, with with anti-gay prejudice. So that it has a unique ability to undermine um, the right to a fair trial. Um, it denies constitutional due process. So can you be more specific? So again, my premise is I agree with you that the homophobic atmosphere yes. was unacceptable, inappropriate. And, and, and so that conduct by the prosecutor was misconduct. Mm -hmm. um, the motion judge articulates, I thought, quite well, while there's overwhelming evidence of uh, the defendant's guilt, including that he shot the victim, I don't know, in, 11 times in two different physical locations, requiring him to stop and reload the murder weapon, requiring him to drag the victim to the 18th hole um, and shoot him there as well. What, why is that not overwhelming evidence of guilt that despite the homophobic atmosphere, which again is inappropriate, would suggest that this is an affirmance? Uh, well, I'll work backwards. So, so with regard to the bullets found um, near the body, um, there were certainly competing inferences there. One competing inference was that Mr. Kemp um, shot at the trees. He actually shot at his gun, I guess, to test it out, um, out by the trees, by the 18th hole where his body was found. The other competing inference... Oh, gee. So let's just say that, okay, not shot in two physical locations, but okay. there is the reloading of the gun, right? There yes. definitely must have been. Yes. Yes. So, All right. So given that there was a shooting of the victim nine times, reloading, and then doing it two more times, let's say, that's how it went, um, why is that not overwhelming evidence that this um, death was premeditated? So in order to judge whether that was guilt, you know, guilt of murder or, or guilt of, say, manslaughter, because manslaughter went to the jury, the jury had to judge the credibility of both Mr. McDermott and Mr. Werner. And Mr. McDermott testified that he was drunk, he was confused, he was traumatized, he was frightened. Um, he, there was no evidence about how long he was taking between um, you know, any reloading so that he could have still been in this traumatized, frantic state. And um, as the jury, unfortunately, was not instructed in this case, this is one of the errors that I put in the, in the brief, <clears throat> the, the, they were not instructed about provocation, really. So there wasn't an instruction, for example, that there has to be, I think this is Stokes, there has to be sufficient time between the provocation and for the passions to cool. There was no evidence like that. So the jury could have, at the very least, returned a, man, a manslaughter verdict if you know, they weren't obscured and undermined by the homophobic um, invective in this trial. Is it, um, uh, how do you explain the fact that um, your client's statement of, of, the, uh, of, of the rape um, and then the way he lays out the facts, as Justice Wendland has, uh, has stated, 
is wholly inconsistent with the factual record. I mean, he, he's way off um, as far as shell casings go and, 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 then, and, and the like. Shouldn't we take that into consideration, that, that his statement is just not credible? And a jury could find are you, are you referring to the trial testimony? Right. So, so there are times when he, you know, this is a 17-year-old boy, you know, testifying on the stand. He's crying. He's he's traumatized. He doesn't recall certain things, but that's consistent with, you know, being drunk, being disoriented, being traumatized. So he doesn't, you know, recall reloading. Yeah, but we but, we've got him um, stealing the guy's stuff. His watch and his pockets are turned out. I mean, it completely corroborates the Commonwealth's theory of robbery. But the jury acquitted him of, of robbery, and they could have found um, uh, they, they could have rejected it altogether because there was there well, no there's no evidence anything was taken. But but the, the the point is that you've got an uphill battle on the facts as far as your client's statement and what the physical evidence shows. Correct. I'm I'm sorry. Could you repeat the? You know, the facts are really wholly inconsistent with your client's testimony. I don't, I don't agree with that, no. Um, but, but as this court found in Vargas, and in this court's opinion in 1984, this court said that this, the jury could have relied on extreme atrocity or cruelty to come to first degree murder. And as this court found in Vargas, extreme atrocity or cruelty shares a lot of factors with manslaughter. So at the very least, it was open to them. It was at least plausible they could have come back with manslaughter in this case. And given that they came back with M2, uh, this court did in 94, was it? I'm sorry, the, this in court, 1984? This court, 84. 84, reduced the <laughs> verdict to uh, murder two. Doesn't that suggest that this court in 82, Four. 84, <laughs> uh, thought it was, there was sufficient evidence of, of malice? The, How do we did square find, that with what you're asking for in terms of manslaughter? Well, because this isn't um, a sufficiency case. This is this is what, what the jury could have found. How do we, with any degree of integrity, say this is manslaughter, no malice, when in 84 um, the court concluded uh, that it was murder too? Because there's no indication that this court considered all of the errors that I'm raising here today. And as this court said in Wat Watkins, no one is infallible, and that um, goes triple um, when gay citizens didn't have equal citizenship in 1984. And if there are no further, uh, no further questions. Thank you. Okay, Attorney McGee. Good morning, Chief Justice Budd, so the justices of the Supreme Judicial Court. May it please the court. Where there was overwhelming evidence of malice of forethought, the motion judge properly found that there was no hypothetical path to a, a manslaughter verdict and appropriately denied the defendant's motion, for, second motion for new trial, and where the defendant proposes no <clears throat> The defendant presented no basis for uh, the unprecedented relief that uh, she asked for right now uh, in, a, in the effect of a double 33 review. Uh, this, the Commonwealth is asking that this court not grant uh, the uh, defendant's second motion. The, the there's, there's no case that I saw, and you didn't say anything, that, that allows parole board testimony in, in post-conviction proceedings, correct? The motion judge handled this appropriately, I would suggest, in the footnote in... Uh, so the answer to that is yes, right? That's correct. You want us to be the first court to allow that? That's... Well, what I would suggest is the motion judge did not err in stating that, albeit these statements were made post... Uh, uh, these statements made post-judgment uh, um, certainly take the sting out of the um, defendant's claims. Um, it doesn't excuse. So, the what kind of standard conduct. is that, right? Take the doesn't take the sting out of the defendant's claims. What, what 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 kind of standard is it considered or not? What's the Commonwealth's position? Should it be considered or not? Well, I, I, the Commonwealth's position is that uh, here uh, the prosecutor's statements um, certainly um, represent misconduct. Um, the remarks during. No, in terms of considering the defendant's statement to the parole board in 2012. What's the Commonwealth's position? Should that be considered on a Rule 30 motion or not? Like a 20, uh, 25B2 motion, uh, the statements um, outside the record could be considered in the context of a Rule 30 motion uh, in the interest of justice. Um, they, they certainly go to uh, the credibility and the weight of uh, the defendant's now statements. Um, but I would suggest uh, the, on the issue of substantial risk of a miscarriage of justice, 
um, on that level, um, they don't excuse the prosecutor's conduct. Have, have you done a, a multi-state review? I know Justice Gaziano brought up Kentucky. Have you done that or are you not? Do we know how if other states consider this or not? I have not, Your Honor, um, but what but, I would So the research hasn't been done is what you're telling us. Correct, but I would suggest that under Pfeiffer, uh, obviously in June, uh, mm -hmm. the court considered um, mental health uh, reports um, that weren't presented to the jury, um, and, and the court found that if it is uh, relevant to the defendant's uh, defense in the case, uh, that it's, it's an appropriate consideration the, for there, a judge. Yeah, there are different, so uh, Dowds was, was more, more, more uh, mental health records as well, right? So we have psychiatric treatment, um, hospital records, et cetera. There's a certain amount of credibility Correct. attached, right? That, that's why we have a statute that allows for admissibility. Um, here, as the Medwood article points out in the Kentucky court writes, you just don't have that credibility um, component or, or, or the same motives that you have when someone's basically trying to find their way out of parole. Into, you, you have less of a motivation. Someone's trying to mollify the parole board and, and say what they have to say, right? That's what the, article, the Law Review article essentially says. I would suggest that every case stands on its own two feet. Um, the uh, defendant here over the last uh, 15 or so years before three different parole boards has stated the same exact thing, that this was a, a murder to rob um, and that the victim in way, no way touched him and, and was a nice person. So, I think um, but isn't so that, that's, I mean. I, th I think the, the, the challenge here that's sort of uh, uh, palpable is, is, is not, this isn't just, oh, there was a statement uh, inculpatory statement at the parole hearing. Yes, I actually did it. It's that we've got an issue here of just uh, um, uh, appalling uh, conduct playing to uh, attitudes, homophobic attitudes, and, um, and, and the issue is whether that reaches the level of prejudice for a new trial. It's not a prophylactic remedy, but whether it reaches that, that level. Right. And, and the problem with the parole board statements is that if they weren't true and this was the defense, that was um, uh, really uh, a, a, a disgusting appeal to, um, uh, to homophobia as well. And, and so it's sort of hard to, to separate in this particular case, although we may need to. Certainly, and, and I'm mindful of also uh, Justice Cipher's concurring opinion um, in due. Uh, where she spoke about the integrity of the justice system. Um, and in addition to the uh, denigration of, uh, of homosexuals uh, in the prosecutor's remarks, uh, there's also this aspect that this defendant has essentially created two lines of cases. Uh, because of his appeals of his parole board cases, uh, you essentially have two separate lines of appeals with relying on two separate sets of facts. And so what is that? I conclude that statement for me. <laughs> in the interest of justice, um, under Rule 30, uh, I think that's something uh, these out of these secondary statements can certainly be considered by the court. Um, but here, the judge didn't, and I think that was appropriate. Well, it uh, didn't, but how do you know that the judge didn't? Because he didn't rely upon these in his findings, um, but for a footnote saying that they but didn't. But mentioned them in the decision, right? In a footnote, he actually said the opposite. He didn't excuse the prosecutor's conduct. They didn't, I mean, he, these statements that were made post-trial don't excuse the prosecutor's conduct during the trial itself. But he found a level of comfort in the fact that <clears throat> they had been made. He did not find a level of comfort. I would suggest that he, he just simply said that they might. So can I go back might, to uh, Justice, I think, Lowy's question. Um, parole board statements, aren't they inherently uh, coercive? In inherently? Yeah, so making them not necessarily a reliable basis upon which to judge whether justice has been done. Perhaps nationwide, but certainly in our, our parole uh, so setting. So you've done a nationwide survey on this? I don't know. Okay. Um, and so and that's why I said perhaps, because yeah. I've only, I'm only familiar with the parole board here, yeah. um, and the defendant's given but, an but opportunity to But so is being prosecuted opening. for murder, right? So if, if he's prepared to lie to the parole board, um, we have, maybe he's prepared to make up a defense that has no basis as well, right? So it, again, it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, you're under pressure to cave to the parole board, but 
if you're that kind of person, maybe you're also caving and you're, you're creating a, a false defense. So it, again, it just seems like it's difficult to analyze, but it's more complicated than uh, it's, it's two-sided, this whole thing. Yes, and, and there's certainly different interests at stake uh, at the parole board um, and the trust in that individual to be able to um, successfully uh, re-enter in the community um, without crime and, and without any um, sort of uh, risk of harm to the public. Uh, here though, uh, on the substantial risk of a miscarriage of justice standard, um, there were overwhelming facts of the defendant's guilt. Uh, and additionally, in 1984, the court did consider the defense and, and did rely upon that defense and, and found that under the circumstances and under 33E review, that the that this should be that the defendant should stand convicted for second degree murder. There's, uh, um, there's one thing we haven't talked about though, which when we're dealing with the substantial risk here, and what what was the extent of the prejudice? And it's it's that my sense is that the judge didn't really do a good job restraining any of this, and arguably may have uh, to some extent augmented. Um, the concern. What do you think of that? Well, under these these facts, um, and and I would, as far as the prejudice to the defendant, um, there were very strong facts of premeditated, deliberate murder. The defendant used the victim's gun, was stealing from him, took his gun, and shot him eleven times with a nine-shot gun. Moved him to the 18th hole, and there were casings found at the 18th hole and emptied out his pockets, took his wedding ring, and fled to Pennsylvania. As far as the defense, going to the defense of this. I'm confused um, by why it's relevant that there are casings at the, the 18th hole. Why is that? Perhaps he was not dead. Um, or or it perhaps also shows, they shot him again and couldn't explain it. It also shows he lied when he gave the first statement, because he Correct. said he didn't shoot him at the, at, at, on the golf course. And, and the jury was free to credit that, uh, or discredit it. Uh, and, and also to your Honor's point about the defense, uh, is that the defendant here, um, <coughs> if, you, if we took his statement, his, his uh, testimony, um, said that he was raped and that Mr. Emmons arrived uh, with the meat truck uh, and that he went out to the meat truck and he brought the meat out to it and tried to, 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 to leave. He had an opportunity um, and that still, despite that, shot the defendant with his own gun. Um, and the jury was free to discredit that and to, to find that that wasn't a, a, a proper self-defense. Um, and, and that is likely what happened here. The court disagreed with that and some, or credited to some extent the defendant's story here and actually found that as a mitigating circumstance here under 33 review. They considered his age. They considered that he uh, might have been under the influence of, of alcohol or marijuana. They also considered um, that he... Um, suffered from a, uh, a, a, an attack. Uh, and under those circumstances, they already reduced this to secondary murder, making him eligible for parole. He would have been eligible for parole anyway, um, but he's had parole hearings uh, every five years for the, since 15 years out. Um, and that's, that, was, that was what the SJC found back then. Um, and what I would ask the court uh, under these circumstances is certainly to find that the prosecutor's uh, remarks uh, uh, of homophobia were improper. But I would ask that under the circumstances of the totality of the case. But it's, it's more than the remarks, though, because you have him call on the other witness, you know, say, well, he, he can't be gay because he didn't come on to me, right? There's that witness. And then the, te the, the, the examination of the wife, right? And saying he was a good red-blooded American, he wouldn't have done this. So it was more than just remarks. It was a tenor of the prosecution. The sort of uh, an unrestrained tenor, which is the point I was making. The, with respect to Werner, um, the, um, the witness to corroborate um, that the victim was in fact gay, um, the, the prosecutor's um, questions to him or, or remarks about him in his closing argument about um, that you shouldn't credit him because he's gay. No, I'm, or, ta I'm talking about the... The, the, the rebuttal witness. Yeah, the, 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 the rebuttal the, witness who oh, came on and yeah, said, yeah, oh, well, yeah, I'm yeah. also a, uh, you know, a, a, a boy who works at this club, and he didn't come on to me. Right, that witness. No. Right, it's sort of, it, it, to, to your opposing counsel's point, 
the entire trial was infected with a theme of homophobia and characteristics about what a homosexual would be like. And, and given that, doesn't it undermine the integrity of the entire trial, which I think is your opposing counsel's point, and, and that this has to go back for a retrial? I would suggest that under the circumstances of the trial, where the defendant's, the defendant's case uh, relied upon um, the defendant, the victim being gay, and then calling a corroborating witness to uh, suggest that he's gay, uh, and then to, uh, for, that it was proper rebuttal for the um, Commonwealth to then call, well, I wouldn't say proper rebuttal, it was in the context of everything, uh, a rebuttal of that. Um, but under the, circ the totality of the case, um, there was just no version of these facts that would suggest that, was, that this was reckless or wanton conduct. So this is this case malice. different from the cases that your opposing counsel relies on um, where it was a racial element that infused um, uh, the entire trial and so we had to flip it and order a new trial? I would suggest to the court that this, there's no structural or, or infection of this, of this jury or, or this case to, to, uh, that mitigate, that in any way changed the verdict in this case. Uh, the but when I go pull the other cases, those cases um, were not overwhelming evidence of guilt? I'm not sure on uh, Mahdi, uh, to be honest with you. Um, what I would suggest in this case is that any hypothetical reduction is impossible. Um, the defendant did. Well, I, I think it's clear there's no good faith way you can get to a manslaughter under these facts. But the question is new trial versus manslaughter. For me, Substantial was, risk of a miscarriage right, of justice. Right. Uh, and, and what I would suggest under, uh, under that, again, is that this the rhetoric um, and, the, and the comments and the remarks, uh, if anything, uh, what defense is arguing is it goes to, the, to, the, to his self-defense argument. And what I would suggest is that self-defense argument was very weak. Um, and for the reasons I had just stated about uh, the opportunity to escape, um, the credibility of it, and the credibility of, of the other facts. And to the extent that it was credible, the SJC gave him that in 1984 and reduced his verdict uh, to a second degree murder based upon that. They, they took consideration of uh, the defendant's self-defense argument and reduced his verdict to second degree but the, murder. But the instruction itself compelled the reduction to second degree murder, right? In and of itself, we, we've got a bunch of cases that say if you don't give the alcohol instruction, you drop it to second degree, right? The court found that there was not a substantial risk of a miscarriage of justice and reduced the verdict based upon 33 based upon his age, um, his maybe possibly being under the influence and, and, uh, and succumbing to a, a, a rape uh, before uh, the murder. That was the basis for the reduction. Do you agree with um, your opposing counsel that uh, the homophobic infection um, was not considered in 1984? It was not considered as part of, of the judgment. Um, what they considered was the defendant's defense, right, so. and they credited it, and they reduced it based upon that. Okay. Any other questions? If there are any further questions, I rest upon my brief.